All right, so it is officially 6-3, and 3 is half a 6, and 3 is times 2 is 6, so it's 6-3. We're going to talk about the hip, and we're going to talk about the hip in both therax, and then we're going to talk about the hip in kines. Some of the lesson will overlap. That is intentional. If the material overlaps between therax and kines, that tells you it's pretty much what? It's kind of... Yeah. Important. Important. Yeah, exactly. Right. I wouldn't put the stuff in multiple slides if it wasn't something that you need to definitely know for your boards. So just be aware of that. So we're going to talk about a couple different things with the hip today. We're going to talk about comminuted fracture, delayed union fracture, displaced hip osteoarthritis, malunion, non-union, uh, osteitis pubis, osteonecrosis, and pubalgia, and simple fracture. So I'm sure a lot of those, if I asked right now, there's at least three or four words on that list that you're probably going to say, I don't know. That's okay. We're going to talk about them as we go through the lesson. So don't totally lose your mind yet. I know Eminem said lose your mind, but no, we're not going to lose it yet. So we're going to start with just a quick review of the hip. So we've got our bony structures, right? Mainly the pelvis, the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis, right, along with the pubis symphysis. On those main bones, we have a couple main kind of bony prominences. We have the ischial tubes, ASIS, PSIS, pelvic crest. What are a lot of those bumps and, you know, ridges, and what are those? a lot of those used for? Muscle connections and Yeah, insertion. muscle connections, good. Just like anatomy, right? Those are your main muscle areas. So if that's why it was so important when Dr. Johnson said, you got to know this is the ischial tube and this is the ASIS, because then in future classes, when you're palpating for, you know, the patient has rectus femoris pain, you should be able to find the ASIS and find the rectus femoris. On top of the pelvis, we also have the femur, right? It's a big, long bone. It has a neck. That neck is about 130 degrees, right? That angle of the neck as a head, and on it, it's got the greater troch, the lesser troch, the trochanteric fossa, which is the space between those, the intertrochanteric crest, linea aspera. I don't know why that one's always one of my favorite words in anatomy, linea aspera. It's just funny to me. Pectineal line, the medial and lateral condyle, and intercondylar fossa. So we have all those little bony stuff all over the anatomy of the hip. Does most of that look familiar? Yes. Okay, good. So let's talk about the characteristics of the hip. The hip is a spheroidal triaxial joint. So what does that literally mean? Spheroidal meaning what? Like spear? Yeah, like a spear. So rounded, right? Triaxial meaning it's got how many degrees of freedom? Three. 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 Good, yeah. It's got an articular surface. It's got that concave acetabulum and the convex head of the femur. And that's going to come into play when we talk about that convex versus concave rule when we stand up or we sit down and things like that. It's got that joint capsule. Remember we talked yesterday, starting to talk about, you know, capsular patterns versus non-capsular patterns. The main one is our ligament of Bigelow or the iliofemoral ligament. That would go from the ilium to the femur, right? We also have a pubofemoral going from the pubis to the femur. And on the back side, we have an ischiofemoral going from the ischium to the femur. When we're looking at these, the iliofemoral, right, because it's coming from the ilium to the femur, is going to limit us going backwards because of its placement. It's also going to help limit our external rotation because of its placement. It'll also limit a little bit of our internal and our abduction. So if you had to look at the one ligament that's probably going to limit us mo most in motion, it's going to be that iliofemoral ligament. And then abduction is limited by the pubofemoral. Well, that kind of makes sense because the pubis is going to be the most inferior part of our pelvis. And as the leg moves away, that's the ligament that's going to be stretched out the farthest. So what kind of motions we got? Well, we got some roll, we got some spin, we got some glide, right? We have flexion in the anterior posterior. We have extension in the posterior to anterior. We have lateral abduction, right? We have medial abduction. We have internal rotation and we have external rotation. So the good news is 
all that kind of goes with the roll and slide there. So it makes it easy. You know, when you have, when you're prepping for the boards, this is a little chart that can help you get the idea of what's the roll and the slide on the bones when you're doing most of the motions of the hip. During, during motion, right? So when we're moving stuff and the pelvis is moving, there's gonna be a distal fixation in stance phase. That means the concave acetabulum is gonna move on the convex femoral head. The acetabulum is gonna slide in the same direction as the pelvis when it moves because of that convex concave rule. And then the hip also comes into play in our balance. It's probably our last stage of balance before we start getting to that, whoa, I need to step out or whoa, I'm going to fall. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about this when we talk about the full, full balance chapter. But when we start losing our balance, the first thing we, thing we kind of do is adjust our ankles, right? Because we kind of adjust the thing closest to the floor first. Then we come up and we kind of drop our knees a little bit, give us a little bit lower base of support. And then we kind of drop our hips a little bit, give a little bit of hip suspension. And then we step to widen our base of support in order to prevent us from falling over. That last step is the stepping strategy. After that, there's only one other strategy left for balance, and that's the falling strategy. And we want to try to avoid that falling strategy. That's why we have all those strategies for balance. And we'll go over them a lot more in depth in balance, so don't totally worry about that right now. So we talked about the motions, but we also have to talk about tilt, right? Because our pelvis, anteriorly pelvic tilts and posteriorly pelvic tilts. It also shifts. It also has some lateral tilt. And there is some rotation, right? So all of that plays in how we generally move. And if you remember, the pelvis is our main kind of guide in both vertical displacement during gait and lateral displacement during gait. You remember what the distance is that you have both vertical and lateral in gait as you're walking? Good, two inches, right? Two inches or what's it in metric? Five centimeters. About, five centimeters. About five centimeters. Good. So that's good because you never know if your board's going to ask you a metric question or a standard question. So it's kind of good to understand both of those. So as I'm walking along, right, moving down the road, my pelvis is going to shift up and down about two inches and it's going to shift right and left about two inches. It's going to form a very nice kind of complete sine wave as I move. So decreased flexibility, we already kind of talked about this a little bit, right? We all said that most of us in this class, except for maybe Dr. Reskin, have some really kind of tight hammies. And when we get that decreased flexibility, and as flexibility decreases, so if the hammies tighten up, and then the quads tighten up, and then the gastrocs tighten up, as those tighten, those muscles tighten, those ground reaction forces, the forces that we get when our feet hit the ground, well, those muscles can no longer absorb some of that shock. So that means that shock is going to be transmitted up to our spine, which is going to lead to what? Back injuries. Yeah, back injuries and back pain, right? Good. So the other problem we can lead to is that patellofemoral impairment. We talked briefly about this, that it does occur a little bit more in females than men because of the higher valgus movement of the knees and because of the change in the angle at the femur. So... When those muscles get weak, especially that vastus medialis oblique, obviously that patella is not going to track properly. And you'll get all kinds of patellofemoral impairment there where you'll get pain when that patella moves and it's a little patellar groove. ACL strain, common injury, right, where the, the tibia kind of shears anteriorly on the femur. That's the job of that ACL is to keep it from shearing that way. But occasionally that happens. Piriformis syndrome, I'd be willing to bet if we went around the class, I know hammies are pretty tight for most of you, but I'm willing to bet we'd find at least a good quarter of you guys that have some piriformis tightness as well, right? And when that piriformis tights down, we're going to talk about where that sciatic nerve goes, and then all that sciatic nerve comes down, tightens down, and we get more back pain, and we get stuff like sciatica. So what happens if we have muscle imbalances? Right? If we have a tight or a shortened tensor fascia latte in a glute medius, what's that going to feel like? Have any of you had tight glute or glute med and TFLs? Where do you get pain at a lot of times? Low back. 
rolled out their legs. Okay, so low back, good. Okay, because again, that ground reaction force is transferred up. And also the lateral aspect of that knee where that TFL attaches via that, what's that long side over there that it attaches onto? What's that band over there? IT band. Yeah, IT band, IT good, band. right? Yeah. So when that gets tight, it's going to pull kind of laterally on that lower portion of the leg, and it's going to cause some knee pain. If the TFL, remember, TFL is itsy-bitsy, right? Versus glute need, which is a pretty chunky muscle. It's a chunky monkey. If the TFL ends up having a little bit of glute medius dominance, meaning that the TFL is stronger than the glute need, we're going to start ignoring that glute medius, right? We talked briefly about that, and we're going to talk about it in the dominance of the two joint hip flexor versus the one joint hip flexor, right? But we know that the TFL is tiny, and we know that the, instead, the in contrary to that, the glute med is pretty big. Which of those is going to allow for a greater force to pull the leg out to the side, the bigger the muscle or the smaller muscle? The bigger? The bigger, yeah, right? So that means if my TFL actually is more dominant, I'm going to use a lot more energy to pull that leg out to the side. And we've learned, if nothing else, we started talking about it. During PT, one of the two or two of the main things we're going to work on with patients is energy conservation. And what's the other big one? Functionality. Gate belts for. Balance. Balance, which leads to safety. Their safety. Safety. Good. Yeah. Right. So that's going to be a good chunk of our kind of our profession is providing patient with some safety guidelines. You know, what do they need to do? What do they not need to do? And then also, how do they save as much energy as they can? Again, think about it. You guys, some you guys are fairly healthy. Now you may have some of you may have some conditions. You know, I have some heart issues and stuff like that. But for the most part, we're healthy individuals. The patients we're going to treat are not going to be healthy individuals. So when we get that muscle imbalance, it's going to throw things off. I talked briefly when we talked about total knee replacements, about how when they do the surgery and they cut through that nice big rectus femoris, that suddenly the patients can't flex their hip. And it's because they've so much used that rectus femoris for hip flexion, they've forgotten about the iliopsoas even though the iliopsoas is our prime hip flexor. So they get some dominance of that. The hamstrings can do the same thing over the glutes, right? The glutes and the hamstrings both help us into extension, but the glutes are our main extenders. Again, if the hamstring come into play, because they're a two joint muscle, it requires a lot more energy than just using those glutes. And then the lateral trunk flexors. We talked about that with gait, right? Because we have the hip abductors, which helps us keep our pelvis kind of level when we're walking, right? Keeps us from getting that contralateral pelvic drop. And I said that one of the things patients can do if they do have that Trendelenburg gait is they can use their big old QL here to kind of hike that hip vertically by pulling on it upwards versus pulling the leg up. And so when that happens, that requires a lot of energy just to move around because you're yanking those pelvic crests way high and you're gonna wear out really easily. So when you have muscle imbalances, the side effect really of muscle imbalance is, right, is poor energy conservation. So now let's add this. We've got somebody that's got a, this is why I should be a doctor, right, with my writing. We've got somebody that's got a two joint hip flexor dominance over the iliopsoas and now has Parkinson's and the Parkinson's is just wearing them out, fatiguing them as it is. Then you get this, their level energy levels go lower. That means they're going to lead to a more sedentary lifestyle. And we know when we go sedentary, our weight goes up because our weight goes up, our depression goes up because all that goes on, we become more sedentary which causes our weight to go up, and we end up in that really vicious cycle where we can't escape it. And that can be really dangerous for patients. Leg length discrepancies or asymmetrical leg length. If we have one leg shorter than the other, what kind of problems might a patient run into? Just thinking off the top of your head. Back problems. 
Back problems, good, okay. So maybe unbalance. <laughs> Balance, yeah. yeah. Right? Because again, when I stand up, I'll slide back here a little bit. When I stand up, if I actually stand on my right leg, my left leg is swinging, right? I've adapted to my left leg being shorter just because, you know, I'm older and I'm wiser now, right? But when that leg is swinging, it also reduces my overall balance load and I have to shift my center of gravity in order to compensate for that leg length discrepancy. We're gonna talk in um, Kines about coxivera versus coxivalga and talk about what the angles are that cause them, but coxivalga is a large angle. Coxivera is a very small angle, decreased angle. That's the way I've always remembered them. Valga has an L, so it's a large angle. Vera, very small, decreased angle. And remember, this is talking about that femoral neck. So here's Mr. McKeever's wonderful drawing class in art. So here's my femoral neck. There's my shaft. If I increase that angle, right, I go for coxivalga. If I decrease that angle and make that angle sharper, so this angle here, I get coxivera. All of that can come into play in leading to a leg length discrepancy because think about it. If my one leg is a nice 130 degree angle and my other leg instead is a 90 degree angle, my femurs will be the same size. But because of that angle change, now I've got a right angle here and 130 here, this leg over here is gonna lose a ton of space. Right, and that's gonna be really uncomfortable for the patient because now they're, excuse me, way off balance. And they'll often walk with kind of a shuffle going on. The other thing that can happen with this is what's known as antiversion or retroversion, right? And that has to do with whether you got kind of duck feet or whether you got penguin feet. So whether your feet are pointed out or whether you come down and your feet are pointed kind of in. And we'll talk about what that causes that a little bit more in uh, Kines because that ties into our testing. True versus apparent leg length. Again, we mentioned this briefly in the last class. The true leg length goes from our ASIS, right? So our big bony prominence in the front of our hip down to medial malleolus. The apparent leg length goes from our belly button, our umbilicus, all the way down to our medial malleolus. One of the skills we're gonna practice in lab is measuring people's leg length because that may be the root of our problem. Think about it, we're seeing a patient for low back pain and they've seen us now for eight weeks and have not gotten any better. There are multiple reasons that could happen. But what if we're like, hmm, let's check their pelvis out and see what we got going on. And all of a sudden we're like, wow, they've got a three inch leg length discrepancy. That definitely could lead to back pain. So we kind of got to keep an eye on all of the things. That's why the PT is so important doing that eval, right? Making sure they check for every little nook and cranny. But even though they check most of the nooks and crannies, we as PTA still need a little bit be investigators and say, hey, you know, Dr. Reskin, I think they might have a leg length discrepancy. Do you want me to go ahead and check and measure for you? Because the worst that happens, you measure it and it comes back normal. Like, hey, we can rule that out. What is the difference, briefly we talked about this, what is the difference between a true leg length discrepancy and an apparent leg length discrepancy? Uh, the true one is five inches, the three to five inches, I think. Okay, that would be a severe true one. Or severe, yeah. So yeah, right. I'm reversed. <laughs> Good guess. That's why I like the guessing. True means what is the problem? The bones themselves. Right? So when we have a true leg length discrepancy, the problem is the bones themselves. It could be the angle, could be one bone is just physically shorter than the others. Whereas a parent, it looks like they have a leg length discrepancy, but it could be something like pelvic tilt. It could be something like an imbalance further up in the spine where they've got a scoliotic curve. So a parent, there's the legs, the, the bones of the legs are equal length, 
but something's still off when we actually measure it. So it tells us that there's something else going on that may not be just bone related. And honestly, when I've measured most of my patients that I've treated, and you know, we're worried about leg length discrepancy, I often find they have a little bit of both. You know, they may have, you know, they may have a true leg length discrepancy, but because they have a true leg length discrepancy, they compensate it by getting an apparent leg length discrepancy. So that's why we're going to check. When we check patients and we're measuring leg length, we're going to measure both true and apparent leg length to make sure we cover our bases. Again, we're looking for breadcrumbs. That's the main thing we're going to look. We, be, we need to become inspector gadgets while we're working it. When I'm walking, so we talked about gait already. If I'm walking and what, what primary part of gait are my hip flexors going to be active in? at least concentrically, either swing phase or stance phase. Swing phase? Swing phase, right? Because it's going to be when I I'll tilt my camera a little bit here. It's going to be when I swing my leg through. That's going to be when they're mainly active, right? Versus your extensors are going to be really important in the kind of that stance phase when you're pushing off and getting that momentum moving you forward. Your hip abductors are most active in which part of swing phase? The beginning, the middle, or the end? When would you see Trendelenburg gait? In the middle? In the middle. Good. Excellent guess. I like this, right? So as I swing through and you watch that pelvis drop, you know that I've got that weak hip abductor. So if my right pelvis drops, which glute medius is involved? The left. The left, right? My left one is too weak. Good. Antalgic gait. I told you guys this already. If I see this on your sheets, you send me a note and you're like, well, you know, they had antalgic gait today. I'm going to take my stress ball and bounce it off you. And you're going to have an antalgic forehead. And I'll actually know what caused that. Right? Antalgic gait just says painful gait again. Putting that on a note tells us nothing. I would be willing to bet when I woke up this morning, I had antalgic gait because I was kind of half awake. Oh, coffee. Right? I had some antalgic gait because I was stiff and I was sore and I didn't want to get out of bed. And I'm on the East Coast right now and God, these times over here are just fun. And when somebody says, well, let's meet at about 7 o'clock in the morning. That's 4 o'clock in the morning our time. I don't like that very much. So nerves. What kind of nerves can get entrapped? And if I say entrapped, what does that mean? Like in, impinged? Like impinged, pinched. good, right? If the police entrap you, what are they doing? They're basically going to take you off the jail, right? So entrapment, nerves are basically be put, put in their own little mini jail. So what nerves can get impinged? Well, we know about the sciatica, right? And sciatic can happen because of piriformis. It can also be caused by, you know, bony obstruction and stuff like that. But sciatica we hear about a lot because we got a lot of old people that's my sciatica is bugging me today, right? And they're talking about their butt being numb and maybe the back of their leg being numb. The other thing we don't think about is obturator. Where does obturator exit the pelvis? Obturator for it. Yeah, wow. It's almost like it's named after it. Begs to be the obturator for Amen. Uh, hold on, I got a question from Riley, which is a great question. Is it generally the femurs that are different lengths? So typically, Riley, at least in, from what I've seen, I'm, and I'm going to use it based upon my, um, what I've encountered in my world, my real world. I don't know if I'm a real world or not. What I've noticed most of my leg length discrepancies being are more femoral angle problems than actually femur length issues. But I have had one or two kids that have come along where literally their femur, and I'm not even joking, the one kid's femur was four inches shorter than another one. Right. And it was just purely that femur just didn't grow. What happened? And if you talk to the doc, because it was one of the docs here in town, they basically said at about six, 
his growth plates just close on the left side, right? And when those growth plates close, femur stops growing. The other one didn't close and grew longer. So the femoral nerve, this is something I know that I've been getting on Dr. Johnson to cover a little bit more in depth, but the femoral nerve, right? And the greater saphenous vein and the femoral vein and the femoral artery all kind of pass through this magical structure in our hip called the femoral triangle. Does that sound roughly familiar from anatomy? Maybe just a petit peu, a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, right? So if you've got all of these structures, right, going through that little tiny kind of triangle, we know that stuff happens in the hand too, right? Where do we have a tight area where we know a lot of structures go through that we get a lot of impingement in the hand? Carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel syndrome. Good, right? And so in reality, looking at that femoral triangle, it's not much different than what we encounter in those carpal tunnels, right? There's a lot of structures going through it, not a lot of room, things get bound down. You guys are going to start doing um, pulses with Dr. O'Neill. And one of the arteries you need to palpate for that pulse is the femoral artery. And guess where you're going to feel that femoral artery at? The femoral triangle. Yeah, right? So what you're going to do, and the best technique I found for that is, I'll tilt my camera down a little bit. I find my ASIS. I know where my pubis is. The femoral triangle is kind of a diagonal line between them about mid. So when I'm dealing with it, right, I'm about here. If I externally rotate my leg, I should be able to find my pulse pretty easily. Your finger will kind of sink down into the femoral triangle and you'll get a really heavy pulse because the femoral artery is a huge artery. It'll be a nice deep thump, 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 thump. And it's funny because it's usually the hardest one for that one and the one behind the knee, the popliteal pulse, are usually the hardest ones for students to find until you find it for the first time. And then when you find that femoral pulse the first time, you never have problems finding it again because it's pretty dominant. This is also where they do surgeries at. So has any of you had family members or maybe parents that have had a heart catheterization? Yep, Brooke says, yep. I had one way back when, many years, many, many moons ago, they actually cut this opening up to the femoral triangle, come hot down here to my femoral artery, and they slice that open. And that's where we're gonna run that tube that goes all the way back to my heart so they can take a picture of my heart. There's my camera. Right, so they'll run the little tube that goes up, it goes to my heart, and they go in and they take pictures of my heart to see for blockages. I mean, it says her aunt's getting one today. It's kind of scary, I'm gonna be honest, um, because when they first cut that femoral artery, you've got to realize that femoral artery's got a ton of pressure behind it. So what do you think happens when they first cut it? The bleeds out. Yeah, it looks like a scene from a horror film. They, so when they brought the, they bring the shield up that kind of goes along your inner groin. It's this big high plastic shield. And when they first, they, like they numb the area obviously, and they cut through your skin so you don't feel that. And then he is like, okay, you're gonna feel some pressure. And it feels like pressure. And then all of a sudden this blood just splattered along that shield. And I'm like, okay, is that normal? He's like, yeah, don't worry about it. It happens all the time. Glad you're not worried about it. I'm terrified. It looks like Freddy Krueger just cut into me. Right? That femoral artery has a ton of pressure. That's where, you know, a lot of your horror movies, you know, people die out. They're bleeding out through their femoral artery, right? Or Grey's Anatomy, somebody comes into the ER. They've got a femoral artery cut, right? They're holding down pressure on it. They're going to bleed out. Yeah, you're going to bleed out pretty quick from that femoral artery. In the military, Guess where one of the areas they focus on if you're doing knife strikes to? Right to that area, right? Because that's a really easy, quick area to cause your enemy to bleed out. But for us, that's all the fun stuff. For us, all the fun stuff Mr. McKeever talks about, right? And Dr. Reskin's now shivering in her corner. 
as this vein's going through here and as this artery's going through here, well, that doesn't leave a lot of room for our nerve. So that nerve can be pinched. So if I've got sciatica, where is my numbness going to be present? My numbness and pain. Leg Down which part of my leg? Down the leg, which part? Posterior. Posterior aspect. Good. If I have femoral nerve impingement, what part of my leg is going to be affected? Medial side. So medial to anterior, right? So medial to anterior surface, right? And interestingly enough, that obturator kind of gets the general pelvic region. So a lot of times it may not go necessarily down your leg, but there are some studies out there that are now showing that we, what we think sometimes is, um, you know, sciatica may be more obturator related, especially when we're talking about pregnancies. You know, when babies down there are moving around and kicking, babies love to kick mom's sciatic and obturator nerve. They're really good at that. They've got like Chuck Norris level skill of kicking it. We talked about this in some common terms in physical therapy, centralization versus peripheralization. It, which one is good, centralization versus or peripheralization? Centralization. Good, right? So let me little draw my little man here, because you know Mr. McKeever is just an artiste du jour. So here's my man, right? He's got a smiley face. Let's say I've got a problem here at, say, L2. Initially, that's where my pain's going to be, right? So if you had those models where the patients draw on them, that's where my pain's going to be. They're going to put their Xs there, or maybe they'll put their minuses for numbness. But as time goes on and we ignore that, the body's going to say, hey, why are you ignoring me? And even if, that pain is there, it's going to say, okay, well, we need to wake this person up and make them realize that they've still got pain in the back. So now they'll send the pain down here, further down your leg. That doesn't necessarily mean that your knee is hurting. Excuse me. It means that the back is sending pain down the periphery. So peripheralization. Our goal in PT when we have these low back patients should be centralization. I always joked when we went out to um, select and did our, our electronic traction unit that we'd put a patient on that low back traction unit and they'd be on it for 15 minutes. They'd fall asleep. They'd get up and they'd be like, man, my leg feels so much better, but now my back kind of hurts. And that's when Mr. McKeever is like, yay, I'm glad your back hurts. And the patient's like, What's wrong with you, idiot? Yeah, peripheralization is a form of referred pain, Brooke. Yeah. Usually when we talk referred pain, a lot of times we're going to talk more like organ referred pain or muscle pain that's referred somewhere else. But in if you look at, I mean, hard kind of dollars to donuts type idea, peripheralization is a referred pain. So they get off that, that low back traction machine. They're like, man, my back is just kind of sore. Then what we're going to do is work on strengthening that low back and working on techniques so that we relieve the pain in their low back. And we give them maintenance activities so that hopefully in the future, they don't have to come back to us for low back pain. Because it's really great to have a repeat client that keeps coming back to us because that's money, obviously, right? But... Ideally, we want to try to get them better right, right away. And this is not picking on chiropractors. So please, if somebody in here has a family member that's a chiropractor, I'm not truly picking on your chiropractor family member. But how many of you have gone to a chiropractor before? I'll talk about that in a second, Joe. It's a good question. I'll re-answer that one. How many, has anyone here gone to a chiropractor, right? And how many of you have had this feel of, don't worry, you know, come back today and then we'll check you on a month. You'll come back and we'll do another adjustment on you. And then in about two more months, come back again. And they kind of build up that plan of you just keep coming back for life. Do you ever feel that way when you're at the chiropractor? Anyone ever? I felt that way when I was there because I went there before I was in PT school or PTA school. I was like, man, my back's sore. 
I'm going to go see a chiropractor. Yeah, they make you feel like you need them to readjust, right? And I, I always joke that once we go to a chiropractor once, we get addicted to crack. Get it? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Come on, that was funny. I don't care what you say. That was funny right there. But it's true. They're going to do those adjustments. And there is. There's a lot of psychosocial kind of positive impact on that cracking sound, right? You guys know that right now. If you crack your knuckles, my knuckles are swollen from plying and stuff like that. They don't crack very well right now. Let's see. Can I? No, I won't crack my neck. That's bad. Okay, I'll crack my wrist. There we go. I cracked my wrist. There's something about that. Right? Even when you crack your neck or you crack your back, there's just something about that sound that's like, oh, yeah, that feels good. And so there is kind of a psychosomatic effect from that crack. Does that mean that it also doesn't help? No. I mean, we do grade five thrust, well, not we, PT does grade five mobilizations of the spine. As PTAs, we will never do grade five mobilizations of the spine. Ever, 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 ever. I wouldn't even do it if I was trained. Just and that that should say something. You know, I've been in PT field since dinosaurs roamed the earth, and I don't want to do grade five mobilizations. I'm terrified of them. But what would happen if the chiropractor not only adjusted your back, but then gave you over to physical therapy so that you know you could work on strengthening your back so you didn't have to constantly come back for adjustments? Wouldn't that be a better process? Yeah, right? Because, you know, it's it's not cheap to go to chiropractors. You know, back in the day when I saw them, they weren't even covered under insurance. So somehow or other, they make you sign up for a cash pay contract for like six months. And I walked out of there going, what did I just sign up for? Did I buy a boat? So yeah, uh, so Joe had asked, where is the optorator? Well, the optor or the operator for pain kind of, or the kind of pain pattern itself. It starts primarily in the pelvic region, Joe, but a lot of times obturator nerve pain may mimic sciatic pain. So it may go down the backside of the leg because that's kind of where that obturator framing is. So you may get some sciatic-like symptoms, but a lot of times it's more in that pelvis region itself that you kind of get achy and sore when you have obturator tightness or obturator impingement. Now I gotta take my great piece of art away to go to the next slide. Such an awesome picture. So what other problems do we have? Well, non-operative management. When we do non-operative management, it means patients not going to go in and get surgery. Osteoarthritis. Who in here has osteoarthritis? Everyone. Probably everyone, right? Yeah. I mean, even Dr. Avreskin in her fantastic shape that she's in, I'm sure somewhere in her body, she's got a little bit of osteoarthritis somewhere. I'm sure. That's just the way it is, right? That's kind of... Uh, it's kind of a, what is it, a rite of passage of getting old. So when we have osteoarthritis, we can lead to our degenerative joint disease, meaning the joints just slowly start breaking down. Can we help slow that down? Sure, right? We can start getting them active, getting them moving. One of the things that's been shown to improve osteoarthritis and improve the overall quality of life of somebody with osteoarthritis is movement. And just like we've said many, many times, motion is lotion. The more we move, the better we feel. So get your moves with every meal. Post-immobilization hypomobility. This is something we're actually encountering pretty heftily right now. What, what concern or what disorder might have made people not move around a lot after going to the hospital, but not for surgery? What do we just go through big time? We're still going through it, but COVID, right? Think about it. You know, just, I'm going to, again, sorry, Riley, you're the last one that posted. You just got to get, get away till Laura, Laura, or Raquel stays for a little bit. But Riley goes in and Riley gets COVID and she ends up in the hospital. If she ends up in the hospital bad enough where she's in the ICU, she's going to spend a lot of time in prone and she's not going to be moving a lot. So, Again, we, that vicious cycle starts kicking in, right? Detraining starts kicking in. So her body overall starts breaking down. The longer you spend in that time, the more deconditioning happens. 
And the more that deconditioning happens, the harder it is to get back. Right? How many of you guys were like, I'm going to say, uh, I mean, like pretty decent athletes in high school? I mean, I was okay. I was, I was better at the martial arts, right? Do you have the same skills you had back then? Right? Why is that? Well, because back then we trained like fiends, right? And it's like, God, no. Back then we trained. You know, I remember when I was training for the martial arts and I was actually training for, because I, I actually had hopes of going to the U.S. Olympics when they, I found out we're adding Taekwondo to the U.S. Olympics. I'm like, I want to get on that team. I trained like a fiend. I was going five days a week training. Now, three days, if I'm lucky, two days most weeks that I train the martial arts. So yeah, right? We detrain a lot faster than we train. It takes us a lot longer to build up that training mode kind of motif and gets us better. So the longer we spend in that post immobilization, the weaker we're going to get. That's why I know for specifically the hospital that I came from, Wellspan, back in Pennsylvania, and I know I use a lot of my experience on this, but I, I talked to a couple of the PTs I work for. One of the first things they started doing with all COVID patients that came in, even if they're ICU and they're bed bound, is ordering PT for them. So they all get a PT eval and a PT BID treatment. Well, that's actually a good thing because that keeps the PT department busy when there's no surgeries coming in, right? The other thing is we found out, guess what we found out if the patient gets PT and they have COVID? What do you think, the, what do you think happens to them? Improved what do you think about their outcomes? Somebody said something. I just said improves their circulation, which improves yeah. getting better faster. Exactly, right? The number one goal if a patient ends up in the hospital is getting them out of the hospital. Has, how many of you guys have spent an extended period of time in the hospital? And I'm talking like a week, maybe two weeks, maybe longer. You know, I spent about a weekend when I did my last neck surgery, and that was just torture for me. Because I felt like, you know, they're coming in at 3 o'clock in the morning to draw blood. And then I just fall asleep from that blood draw. And then at 4 o'clock, they come in to take my vitals. I'm not getting any rest. I'm not getting up and moving as much because I can't go out and walk the halls because PT says I'm safe to walk the halls. And so overall, your, your morale kind of goes down. And then they bring that wonderful lunch and dinner. And you look at it and go, mmm, baby food. Right? There's a, there is a kind of just unhealthy atmosphere in a hospital to the point that I know that a lot, some clinicians that used to work acute care now don't even want to work acute care because even working in acute care to them are like, you know, when I'm walking around the hospital, it just reminds me of being in the hospital and I don't want to be in the hospital. I'd much rather be in the outpatient when people are coming to see me. And I'm the exact opposite. I love working in the hospital. The hospital is fun to me. I get to run around the floors and try to figure out where 7D is and all that fun stuff. But patients just don't get good, better or not. Don't, don't get gooder in the hospital. I'm in Virginia. I'm in Appalachia. We got to get gooder. Right? Gooder drinking some water. So there is that. Structural and functional impairments. Overall, as we get older, right, we're going to build up some osteoarthritis, maybe a little bit of degenerative joint disease in the hip. The hips are going to start breaking down. We're going to want to start holding off as long as we can. We want to hold those surgeries off and put them off as much as we can because we know we're going to talk about um, total hip replacement in Kines. We actually have a great video on that. But when we get a, any type of a joint replacement, a time clock starts. And what I mean by that is there's a time clock that that joint replacement stays patent or stays valid. And it's still solid. You know, it's, and most of the new joint replacements are up to about 15 years now, so that's better. It used to be like seven when we had the ceramic hips. So every seven years, you're going back in for a revision. And we know every time you cut open skin, it gets weaker. And every time you cut through muscle, it gets weaker. So we want to try to put those things off as long as we can. What else do you think is a common thing that causes injuries in the hips? For older folks, especially. Falls. Falls. Yeah. Right. So remember, I talked about this briefly. Remember, I said, what is the most fractured bone in the human body? 
if that's on your boards. What's the most fractured bone in the human body? Your clavicle, right? Clavicle, good. What is the most commonly fractured bone in adults under 65? The hips. No, under 65. Scaphoid, right? Good. Scaphoid from what? What's that called? What did you call it? Foosh? Foosh. There we go, right? Fall on outstretched hands, right? So where's my little cursor? There's my cursor. I always like calling it a cursor because back when I was, was Clippy, I miss Clippy, Clippy cursing at me. Foosh, right? Fall on outstretched. That's an H, I promise you. Hands. This, right? When you fall like that, those uh, scaphoids are going to snap, crackle, pop, and you're probably also going to end up with Another fracture of the radius. Do you know what the other fracture of the radius you might end up with is called? Starts with a C. I know Dr. O'Neill talked about it when he was talking about ultrasound. A Collie's fracture. Because the scapegoat gets driven back into the radius and you get a fracture, right? So now let's change that up. So I don't remember who it was that answered me about the hips. What is the most commonly fractured bone in adults over 65? That is where now we say the hips, right? So that's that, those are three worded questions a little differently on your boards. The most commonly fractured bone is the clavicle. The most commonly fractured bone in adults under 65 during falls, scaphoid. The most commonly fractured bone in adults over 65 during falls is our hip, right? So that can cause all kinds of problems. We just talked about this participation restriction. As we get more and more declined, we start stop doing things, that progressive degeneration occurs. Mr. McKeever? Yep. That's my name, I think. Hold on. I'll have a name badge. <laughs> Just Why is the clavicle the most commonly fractured? Does that have to deal with falls too? Like just it can. Young it can absolutely. What else is what? Why else do you think it might be? Mm, I just think like it's probably just fragile and easy to like dislocate. Yeah, I mean, I just know. look at the skate or yeah, look at the skate point. Look at the clavicle itself, right? Where the bone sits, it's not a true weight bearing bone but it's a weight mm -hmm. distributing bone. So it helps distribute some of that work that you do over your shoulders into your sternum. So it can, it's kind of like, I like to think of that almost as like the, um, when, I, when I think of this, I think of this almost like the pubis of the shoulder because the pubis is gonna transfer some of that leg stuff into the hips and then up into the back, right? Mm -hmm. This kind of distributes the same thing. Some of that force that's going through your arms into your chest so that it can meet up here with your chest, which disperses it a little bit. Whereas your scapula is going to disperse it across the back, right? So yeah, I mean, there, and also you getting hit there is common, right? I know for myself, at least three times since I've been in this hotel room, I have walked into a door jam. I don't know why. I, I don't know what it is about door jams. I can see them. But for whatever reason, I'm just stupid and I walk into a door jam. And most of the time that I walk into that door jam, I'm hitting right about there. Mm -hmm. Right? Because what do you think my what do you think I'm doing is causing me to walk into the door jam? <laughs> yeah. I'm bent over texting, right? There's a great video I just saw, and I don't, I don't know if you guys have seen it. If you haven't, you have to go find it. There was a great video of a girl that fell into the Bellagio pool the other day because she was texting and walking and didn't pay attention and went right over the boundaries into the pool not the pool but the, the fountains so don't text and walk folks but yes yeah, so that's a lot of it has to do with the way the bone is structured and also if you actually look at a clavicle and you take one and you dissect it it's probably the closest to a bird-like bone that we have in the human body meaning that it's not very thick there's not a lot of meat to it it's pretty easy to break does that make sense Yes, thank you. No problem. I like questions. Questions make people learn. Whenever we have problems and we start getting an issue, so whether I've got a fall and I don't have a fracture, but I still fell and really bruised up my hip, or maybe I've got advanced osteoarthritis, we're going to move through those phases, right? We're going to move through that acute, 
subacute into the more return to work or return to function slash chronic phase. The protection phase is that acute phase. When you see that term protection phase on your boards, you should think that the patient is in the acute phase, right? That's when they're, oh, acute patient. And we talked about this with range of motion, right? In that acute phase, what type of range of motion do we want to do with them? Sure. Well, you're wrong. See around, good, yeah, right, passive. We want to do more of the passive range of motion than the active range of motion. We're also going to provide patients with education. I like when they're in the acute phase for education because they're a captive prisoner, right? If I just, if I have little old Millie and she just fell and has her hip all black and blue and she's in the hospital getting seen for that and we're making sure she doesn't have a hematoma or anything like that, it's not like she can get out of the bed and run away from me. Right? Okay, Millie, let's have a talk about what's going on with you. How many times have you fallen this year? Oh, I've fallen five times. Okay. You know, didn't the PT, when the last time you fell came in, recommend you using a walker? Yeah, but I'm not an old lady. And now we're on the fifth fall. Yeah, maybe I'm starting to become an old lady. Right? You've got that kind of captive audience where you can provide a lot of education with them. PT is... I, honestly, most of the PTs I know kind of really like that acute phase because they can get in and talk to the patient. The patient's not trying to run off to go play bingo. Our goal should be decreased pain at rest. Why would we want to decrease pain at rest? What happens when we're resting? Healing. Healing. Yeah. Right. So when we're, we're resting and we're kind of taking that time off, our healing starts happening. Right. And think about that even from yourself. When you work really hard at the gym and you come home and you're able to sit back and just relax for a few minutes, your body at that point starts the recovery process, right? If you were to get immediately up and go run another mile, you know, it may be good for training your cardio, but at the same time, it's not giving your muscles time to kind of recuperate. So yeah, we want to decrease that pain so they can rest through it. We also want to decrease pain during weight-bearing activities. We're in the hospital again. They may not be able to do a ton of things, but some of the things they're going to be doing is toileting, transferring, and maybe brushing their teeth and stuff like that. All of that, they should be weight-bearing through, right? So that means when I need to go to the bathroom, I shouldn't be using a bedpan unless I absolutely need to use a bedpan. The doctor ordered me not to move. They should be getting up and going to the bathroom. They shouldn't be brushing their teeth in bed with a little spittoon, right? They should be getting up, going into the bathroom. Why? That's what we do at home, right? I don't know about you guys, but I don't have a spittoon sitting beside my bed with my toothpaste and my toothbrush and a little cup of water so that as soon as I roll over in bed, I just start brushing my teeth in bed. I've got to go into the bathroom. That's an activity of daily living. We want to work on that. They should be doing all of those kind of things, getting dressed, right? Decreasing the pain while they get dressed. That should be weight bearing. And then decrease the effect of stiffness and re retain available male range of motion, which is that passive range of motion activities. There we go. Oh. Dr. Sokal says hi. So when we get out of that acute phase and start moving into the controlled motion, when I see controlled motion on the boards, what a, so when you see controlled motion phase, what word did I say that I want you guys to kind of think of? So if that protection phase is acute, controlled motion is what? Subacute. Subacute, good. We're starting to get out of that acute injury phase. We may start doing some heat with the patient, right? And then return to function, this can also lead into a chronic phase of the wound or the, yeah, I think wound. I'm on wound care because I'm prepping some lessons for Sunday. Um, Chronic phase is where we kind of get into that, the pain or the problem just leads on. It just keeps coming back, right? Maybe the patient keeps falling. We need to analyze why that happens. We're going to progressively increase joint play and soft tissue mobility, get them up and moving, doing some soft tissue, maybe some scar mobs if they've got some scars that might need mobilization. Improve joint tracking and improve range of motion, pain-free. So maybe getting them on those pulleys and getting that, well, this, this is talking about the hip. 
That was good. Mr. McKeever talked about shoulder. Totally changed joints. Get back to the hip. Getting them on a new step and getting those legs moving, right? Getting them pumping. Maybe getting them on a treadmill and walking a little bit. Do you remember what I said a good way to help lengthen the hamstring is on the treadmill? Walking which way? Backwards. Backwards, yeah. But let's say you have little old Millie. Do you want to just throw her on the treadmill backwards and put her up to like four miles an hour? Yeah, no, good, good. I'm glad Riley said that, right? No, because little Millie's going to go shooting off the back of the treadmill and into the mirror across the room. And you're going to have to fill out a false report and, every, you know, dogs and cats are going to live together. You're going to have mass hysteria. So you want to be up there with them. What should she have on if she's on those devices? Gate belt. Gate belt, good, right? ADGB, always be gate belting. We're going to improve muscle support performance by supporting muscles. If maybe their hamstrings are weak, right? We know that the glutes work in contract with the hamstrings. So we might start working a little bit of more glutes so that they can compensate for weak hamstrings that are maybe aren't going to ever return. And aerobic capacity. I noticed this actually on my trip back here because pretty much everything in this area is uphill. Like, it's funny. I, I swear to God, even when you go uphill, for some reason, when you come back down, it's still uphill. I don't know how that works. It feels like it. And, you know, I'm used to running on flat land in Vegas. My aerobic capacity is really good for flat land running. But man, I went out running the other day, and I'm going, like, at a 65-degree angle. And I got about halfway up the hill, and I'm like, okay, let's take a break. My aerobic capacity wasn't there for that. Their aerobic capacity is going to be down because they had some time of downtime. And, again, patient education. Patient education is also going to include family education, right? Talking to the family saying, you know, this is what the, she needs to do. Your, your grandmother needs to do to stay, remain independent. The PT is going to have a hand in that. PT is going to tell you, here are my home exercise program. I want you to teach the family and the patient, right? So we're going to work really hand in hand together so that we can get them discharged out of the hospital and maybe even to see outpatients so they can get a little bit more care. What time is it? It is currently 503. I'm not ready for a break yet. We have a little bit longer. So let's talk about the most common surgery that happens with hips. And that is a taha or a taher, depending upon what you want. A total hip arthroplasty. So a total means what? The whole hip is being replaced. Hip, the joint, arthro. Plasty, break that down. Arthro meaning? Joint. Good. Plasty meaning what? Surgical repair. Surgical repair, good. Yeah, awesome. Dr. Freskin, you taught them well, I'm proud. Right, so total hip surgical repair of the joint. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. So when we get a total hip arthroplasty, they're going to replace pretty much everything in the hip. So what does that mean they're going to replace? Well, they're going to replace the acetabulum, right? So they're going to replace that acetabulum in that pelvis. So they're going to go in and they're going to burr grind that out. We have actually a great video on that. And then they're going to go in here and they're going to replace the head of the femur as well as the neck. So they're going to come in here with a saw, cut that off about there, and they're going to put a steel rod well, actually, first a vertical rod down in, and then a steel, another rod, or actually titanium rod that mounts to that. And then they're going to screw a new femoral head on, and then they'll put it all back together. I always joke, if you get a chance, or well, I joke about getting a chance, but if you get a chance to view surgeries like this on your clinical affiliation, take them. They are fantastic learning experiences. You will learn why patients hurt so much after surgery. Because total hip replacements, total knee replacements, total shoulders, spinal and surgeries. They're a lot more like carpentry than they are surgery because they have bone chisels, saws, screwdrivers, drills. It's not like you got a scalpel and some hands, right? So you got to kind of think about that. That's going to put a lot of strain on the body. So why would, you, what do you think some reasons why the surgeon would come and say, okay, you know what? No, you need surgery. 
What are some, what do you, what are they going to look at and say, yeah, definitely this patient needs some surgery? They lost blood supply. Good. Yeah. So maybe the blood supply here going up to my femur, my femoral, femoral head, my femoral head is gone. And that's called femoral head avasculitis, right? Where the blood vessels aren't going up there. And they'll eventually lead to femoral head necrosis. So the head starts dying. Same thing can happen here in the acetabulum, where the acetabulum is all burred up. So it's got little chunks in it that now every time that femoral head moves in there, it's just kind of grinding and clunking. Or worse, they fell and completely snapped off that femoral neck. Well, I guess it's a good time for a replacement, huh? Might as well fix it. Even with that, most of the times when a patient is going to have a total hip arthroplasty, before they go in for the surgery, guess who they're going to have to come see first? Physical therapist. Yeah, physical therapy, right? Because magically, and I'm sure Dr. Reskin can even chime in on this, sometimes what we find is they come in for physical therapy, they do eight weeks of physical therapy before they go in for surgery, and maybe they don't need it as soon as they thought. Because it wasn't so much that they needed the surgery and the femoral head was that bad. It was more that they had so many muscle imbalances that they couldn't handle that pain in that hip anymore. And so now like, oh, you know what? Maybe the doc says, we can probably put that off a year or two. Let's get you to lose some weight a little bit before we get there. Because we find, guess what? Losing weight helps a lot on the joints. I can speak from experience. I'm up about 20 to 30 pounds over what I want to be. And I definitely feel it on my hips and my knees. But just like anything, if you take your car to a mechanic, the mechanic's going to find something to fix, right? They always, that's kind of the way it works. You go to see a surgeon, the surgeon's job is surgery. Now, most of them aren't just money grabbers are going to say every person needs surgery, but their job is surgery. That's why a lot of insurances will say the patient has to have physical therapy before they go in for surgery. The other thing we actually, there was a study done back at, again, Wellspan, the hospital I worked at, with... Again, a very controlled, very small patient sample size, so not a really good replicable study. It would be good doing it on a macro scale, but a very small study that we found that if the patients came in for physical therapy before they went in for surgery, if I ever need to replace my air filter, exactly, right? That's exactly right, Truman. You're 100% right. I just replaced it last week, and it needs replaced again. It's funny how that happens when you go to mechanic. But... We found out that the patients, if they go to physical therapy before surgery, we see them before surgery, we help them explain what's going to happen during and after surgery, they have better outcomes after surgery. Well, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, if you had knowledge, you know, explicit knowledge of what's going to go on in the surgery, you know, even showing them a video of a total hip replacement, if they can tolerate it, is really good because it kind of shows them what's going to go on. You know, and telling them, once you come out, you're going to need a walker for a couple of days. This is how we're going to use a walker. This is how you're going to get your drinks and your food, and you're still going to be independent. Don't worry. This is what we're going to look like. You're going to be in pain. That's okay, right? Because we obviously, we know that we try to get rid of all pain, but that may not always be possible. It sets them up, and it has this mental kind of setup and protection around them. They go in for surgery. They come out. They are a lot better. And again, subjective finding here, not objective in surgery. I find that ladies do better with total hip replacements and total knee replacements over men, especially total hip replacements. I don't know what it is about that surgery in particular, but for whatever reason, most of the, the ladies that I've seen come out of total hip replacements come out a little bit more ambulatory than guys do. Again, subjective what I've seen, but... I mean, when you think about it, it kind of makes sense because your hips are a little different than ours anyway, and maybe there's something to say about that. So looking at this, preoperative management is seeing PT, right? Procedure. Well, we've been doing these for a while, a long while, actually, at this point. They used to make most of the prosthetic devices out of ceramic. So you would have a ceramic cup for the acetabulum. You'd have a ceramic head, and then you'd have stainless steel components. Does anyone see a, ladies are stronger. I'm not going to try to argue that either way because Truman might attack me here. No, just kidding. Does anyone see a problem with the parts being made fully out of ceramics? Yeah, they're so fragile. Yeah, right? 
definitely could be more fragile than something that's not made of ceramics. And even the stainless steel, stainless steel is great, still not the strongest material in the world, right? So now we use a lot more titanium parts. A lot of the cup, so the acetabular cup is still ceramic because ceramics are nice and smooth. There's plastic cups as well. But we find that most of the rest of the actual hip replacement is now made of titanium. Why? Well, because it lasts longer. Cemented versus uncemented fixation. Remember I told you you have this long bar that they're gonna shove down in the femur. So here's my femur bone. This bar is gonna go down in the intermedullary canal of the femur. There are two ways they can put that in. One, they can burr out that kind of, that intermedullary canal, and then just kind of pound that bar down in, and it naturally sets because of the tissue there. But if you have a lot more porous bone structure like osteoporosis, it's not gonna set and it's gonna weaken it. So a lot of times they may have to fill it with cement. I'm gonna give you a little hint here. If you guys do go in for a total hip replacement or total knee replacement, if the surgeon says, here, take the cement and work it for me. Let me know when it's ready to be used. You'll know it. Don't do that. They're tricking you. They're playing a little trick on you. It's a fun joke that the surgeons play on you because the cement is a thermoactivated cement, meaning the more you work it, guess what happens to it? It gets really hot. So you're sitting there thinking that you're having fun. They're telling you to help with them. And you're like, okay, I'm working and I'm working. And all of a sudden it gets super hot. And you drop it and they laugh and like, oh my God, now it's not sterile. In reality, they were just having a little bit of fun at your expense. What happened to me? So just warning you. But the cement itself will fill in all those little holes in there that might happen from osteoporosis and make a, the one that wouldn't sit in there nicely a little bit more, I guess, cemented in place. We said the THR involves replacing the femoral head and the acetabulum. Why might it happen? Rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, osteonecrosis, fractures. You can do it just because of pain and reduced ambulation if the hip is causing the reduced ambulation, right? There has to be some specifics for that for insurance. When they go through this process, you have to imagine, and we're going to show that in this, the video I have for it, that there's all kinds of femoral head sizes, and they've got to screw a femoral head on, fit it into the socket, test the leg around, nope, that hip's not good enough, dislocate it, pull that socket off, put a new one on, pop that back into place, move it around, nope, that one's too big now, Screw that one off, screw the new one on. Oh, that one is just right to allow normal hip motion. So there's selection that goes in when they're doing the surgery. When I have that surgery, say, let's say I have a total hip replacement. I'm sure I'll have one sometime in the future. When I have that total hip replacement, what do you think are some complications that might happen after surgery? Well, we have post-surgical immobilization, obviously. I don't want to get out of bed because I hurt. But what else could happen? Like infections? Infection's the big one, right? Yeah, post-surgical infection. And when that happens, they have to take all those components back out, and you're going to be non-weight-bearing on that hip for 6 to 12 weeks before they can put the parts back in. That's going to stink, wouldn't it? Right? They put actually a spacer in there and it's got some medication in it to kill the infection. That's the number one thing that can happen. What else do you think could happen? Atrophy. Yep, atrophy. Good. Other hip might need surgery because of compensation. Great. Good. That's thinking long-term, Anthony. Good. What other problems happen when you get surgeries that can happen in your vascular system? Like kind of like your body doesn't take the material? Well, yeah, yeah, okay. Yep, you could do a, a materials rejection. Sure. There's the other one. Amanda got it. Blood clots. Big time, right? Especially if the older you are, the more likely you might be to get a blood clot, especially if you have pre-existing clotting conditions. So yes, yeah, so all those we have to watch for. The other thing that can happen is, depending upon the approach, meaning where the surgeon goes in to do the surgery, you can end up getting an impinged nerve. So maybe the obturator nerve gets pinched when they put that femoral component back in. So because literally it's going to pop in place, you might get the obturator nerve. You might get the sciatic nerve pinched. I'm actually going to talk about that in a second. That's actually a really good question, Amanda. So Amanda asks, what's the difference between a THA and a THR? 
So depending upon how that femoral component is fixed, whether it's cemented or non-cemented, and depends upon how the surgeon does the surgery, an anterior approach, a lateral approach, posterior approach, will depend upon what their weight-bearing status is. Most times, patients are going to come out as WBAT, W-B-A-T. What does that mean? Weight-bearing is tolerated. tolerated. Weight-bearing is tolerated, right? Or as I like to say to the patient, the doc has fixed you. Put some weight on that leg, right? That means put as much as they can tolerate on it, right? They're like, ow, oh, it hurts. I'm not going to put any weight on it. No, they've got to put some meat. They got to put some weight in it. They got to get some skin in the game to get back to normal. They may come out non-weight bearing. At that point, we have to adhere to that. And that's going to be a battle. We have to constantly fight them. Okay, you remember, you can't put that foot down. Hey, remember, no putting that foot down. And so back to Amanda's question, what's the actual difference between a THA and a THR? So a THA is the name of the surgery, right? A THR is actually the billing term. That's the way it really should be. So a THA is the actual surgical process. A total hip replacement is what the insurers usually call it. Caveat to that. On the East Coast, at least where I'm from, a THA is a hemiarthroplasty. I don't know why that is. In Pennsylvania, it's a hemiarthroplasty, meaning half of the joint is replaced meaning either the femoral component or the acetabular component, whereas this one is a total replacement. I don't know why they're that way on back where I'm from. Uh, I'm guessing it was some doctor that started that way and it just kind of spread out through the whole central PA area. But in this area, THR and THA are often used pretty interchangeably because they really mean the same thing. Total hip replacement is replacing the total hip. Total hip arthroplasty is replacing the total hip. So, and I, my drawings are fantastic. I'm the most awesome drawer in the world. So, it is, let's take a break. So, I'm going to pause sharing here. So, we're going to talk about the different approaches, and that takes a little bit of time, and I want to make sure we cover this in depth. And stop sharing here. So we're back from break. So now last time we left, last we left our intrepid adventures, we were talking about total hip replacements. One of the things you will find with total hip replacements are that based upon the approach, and when you hear approach, it means how did the surgeon go into the hip? Where did they make the cut? So there are three primary approaches. There is a posterior otherwise also called a posterior lateral. There is an anterior, and there is a lateral or an anterior lateral. So I like to think of that more just thinking that there's a post, an anterior, and a lateral approach for the surgeries. That makes it clearer in my head, right? So if I have an anterior approach for my hip, I'm going to go through the front of my leg to do the hip replacement. If I have a lateral approach, I'm going to go through the side. If I have a posterior approach, I'm going to go through the bottom and go through kind of the, the glutes. Each of those hip procedures have their own precautions. I'm going to give the precautions for the surgeons that I know in this area. And these are what the book says as well. There are some debate between the anterior and anterior lateral, but I'm going to go by what the book says and by what surgeons in our area say. So with a posterior approach, posterior approach means that my surgical site is going to be back here kind of along that ischial tuberosity region. Actually, just like PSIS to uh, ischial tuberosity. They're going to go through that way. They're going to peel apart the muscle, pop the joint out, cut the bone off, replace the hip. The precautions for that are going to be no hip flexion past 90 degrees. So no bring the leg way up. No also bending way down. No internal rotation, okay? And then no adduction. So the problem is you say those magical words to a patient and their eyes glaze over about the time you say greater than 90 degrees. So no bending, 
right? Way over is the way I kind of work that one. Internal rotation, I say no turning the toes in. And what about no adduction? What do you think I use for no adduction? Like crossing the leg. Yep, there you go. No crossing your legs. The big no-no out of all of these is no doing all three of those things together. That can actually pop that hip socket right back out where they did the surgery, right? And think about that for a second. So if my surgical site's back here on my bottom and I flex my hip way up, I am stretching that surgical site about as much as I can. So that's why we're protecting that surgical site. The idea here is if they do these motions too frequently, it can actually cause the hip to dislocate. So going to the patient with the posterior approach, I see you had a posterior approach. Let's review your total hip replacement precautions. How often do you think you should review their hip precautions with them? A lot. A lot. Good. That's <laughs> I like a, a lot. Yeah. I usually review it at least once a visit, if not twice. So I usually, for me, honestly, I usually review it at the beginning of the visit and at the end of my visit. So let's, let's go ahead and talk about what are your hip precautions. We go through them. No bending way over, no turning your toes in, no crossing your legs. At the end of the session, okay, what were those precautions again? And I'm going to document in my note that I reviewed the total hip precautions with them. I'm going to talk about how long these precautions are for in a second because I already can see somebody getting ready to ask that. If the approach goes in through the front of the hip, an anterior approach, instead of doing hip flexion, they're going to be limited in hip extension. And it's going to be no extension past neutral. So it's going to stop right kind of at when you're straight up and down. No external rotation and no abduction. So it's the exact opposite of a posterior approach. So no putting your leg way back, no turning your toes out, and no bring your leg away from your body. Do both of those kind of make sense so far? Anterolateral, typically there are no restrictions or a lateral approach, but it may be doctor dependent. Some doctors will put posterior approach precautions, some may have anterior approach. It kind of depends upon the strength of the muscle and the capsule when they pull it apart. It's one of the more minimally evasive procedures, and it also tends to have a better result. The most common approach if you have a board question, is a posterior approach. Does anyone have an idea why that's the most common approach? Probably because there's less muscle to get through. That, that would be logical. Actually, that's the lateral. You would think that would be. This is actually harder. Is it's it the oldest. Because, uh, is it because the, the precautions aren't very natural for like natural movement? Okay. That could be, yeah, that could be. And honestly, that, there, that may be the real reason for it. But if you ask the surgeons, the answer I get is because it's the most common and it's what we learn. Because that one's been around the longest. I think Anthony's not a bad, got a bad idea of protection of the femoral triangle. That's not a bad idea, Anthony. Safety is one of them, right? But in reality, when you ask the surgeons, they'll just say, well, that's what I learned in school. And they didn't take time to learn a new approach. So, I don't know. Could be anything. I love it when I see a lateral because most of the time the patient's got pretty low pain and they're also got no precautions most times. So, how long do these precautions last? Well, it depends. Most of the time with this anterior approach from what I've seen in the valley here, the precautions are going to be about for a year. That one sucks because posterior is usually for life. But what do we think we're going to tell the patient when they ask, well, how long do I have to do these precautions for? What's a good answer there? Like two to three months, maybe. There's an easier answer than that. Good guess. 
Physical future. Okay. Till you heal. Yeah, my usual answer to that is until the doc tells you so. Honestly, that's the answer I use. Until the doctor says you do not have to use your precautions anymore. It makes it easy, right? doesn't it? Who's that put the onus back on? Puts the onus back on the doc. Right? And the doctor then will tell them when they can stop using those precautions. Brooke, you're going to have a question. What's your question? Wait, you said that anterior is one year. What is posterior? You said, I'm sorry, what was that again? Um, anterior is one year. Is that same for posterior? Or posterior, is posterior is usually for life. For life, okay. Yeah. From those surgeons I've dealt with before, they usually say the posterior is going to be for life. And it's just because of the way the, they cut the muscles, but it may only be a year. Some docs have an 18 month restriction on it. It may be that they get to six months and they're a rock star and all those muscles are healed. And they say, you can ignore your precautions now. But I've just found that even, you know, a year or two years out, there's still a risk of dislocation. So you just have to kind of be careful. And I just, my go-to question when they, or my go-to answer when they say that is, when your surgeon says, you don't have to do these precautions anymore. And I said, especially down here with if the anterior laterals, because most of the time they don't have it. And if you look on the internet, a lot of times they'll say, well, these have no precautions. And they're like, well, why do I have precautions? Because your doc wanted them just to make sure you heal properly. So when he's ready to say you don't have them, he'll tell you. And it's okay. Um, the PT may actually call the doc and say, hey, the patient wants to know how long they're going to have these precautions for. And PT will build up a rapport with most docs. Yeah, John. Uh, you probably already um, talked about this, but um, are there any specific like type of injuries where um, each one of these approaches would be better, or is that just kind of based off the doctor? It's usually more than more than likely based on the doctor. I have seen a lot more of my fractures are getting the the lateral approach. So it seems like if you've gotten a fracture, they're going in through the side. Maybe because there's already bruising there, they can drain the bruising out. I don't know. Um, but it's mainly just based upon the training of the doc. Yeah, because I was I was gonna ask is like if there's no restrictions um on the lateral one, why isn't there more of those done? And a lot of the younger docs are doing these. A lot of the younger docs are doing the laterals. But again, just like anyone else, is there a slight risk to going for somebody that's a brand new, fresh out of college, young doc? Sure. Right? And I mean, not a big risk. They're still doctors. I mean, that's kind of their job, right? But yeah, you, you know, they may not have done a lot of surgeries yet. They've done a lot of surgeries in school. Great. But, you know, you, you got that grizzly old veteran who's done 90 total hip replacements a week for 50 years. They know what they're doing with that posterior hip. They can get in and out quick and they're done. Um, there's one doc in town that I know that that's all he does is posterior hips. And when he does his posterior hips, he does like three an hour and he's in and out and done. He goes on to the next one. He does a full day of eight hours of surgery. So he's doing 25, 30 patients a day. And he's just gotten that pretty. You ask him why he does posterior hips. He's like, cause I'm good at it. I guess I can't argue with that logic, right? I mean, he's the doc. I'm not going to argue with him anyway. I've learned not to argue with doctors. Do the precautions make sense at least though? The actual type. So you're going to have to know these. So this is going to be one that you're going to have to start learning. Posterior is your biggest one because that's what a lot of your board questions are going to be on is on posterior hips. So what are some in complications? Interoperative complications. You could actually have a heart attack while you're on the table right? Um, every time you go under anesthesia, there's a risk you may not come out from it. Uh, er early postoperative complications are a lot of those infections. Late, we can have nerve damage problems. They can dislocate, but typically the dislocation is not caused by the surgery, but it's caused by the patient not following their precautions. A lot of times, if the doc goes in and realizes before surgery, the patient has a leg length discrepancy, they will fix that while they're in there doing the surgery. Now imagine, you know, Amanda's been walking on her legs for the past, you know, 50 years. 
And she goes in and gets total hip replacement. She's always had a you know, two or three inch leg length discrepancy. She goes in for total hip replacement, comes out, and the doc fixes that. Well, I'm making you a little bit older, I know. But the doc fixes that leg length discrepancy. Is that going to feel weird the first time that she walks? Because now her legs are even. Right? She's going to feel a little, a little off, right? Balance is going to be a little different. Sometimes we will immobilize after post-op, but it's not very common. Again, the weight-bearing considerations are going to be set by the doc. Most times it's going to be weight-bearing as tolerated, but make sure you check that because that's going to be important to tell your patients what their process is. In early post-op management, what type of exercises do you think we're going to be doing a lot of? What were those early exercises I talked about to stabilize the joint? Isometrics. Good, right? We're going to be doing some glute sets, maybe some ham sets, some quad sets. Get that hip stabilized because if we stabilize, we can eventually mobilize, right? You have to be stable before you become mobile and then you can become hostile. Uh, exercise progression, we're just going to keep moving them. We're going to start with those isometrics, move into more standard activities, and then get to back to functional training. There are a couple accelerated rehabilitation programs for this. The more therapy the patient gets, the better the outcomes are. So if they're able to go three days a week for outpatient surgery or outpatient therapy after surgery, they're going to get better. What can happen long-term? Well, the components can loosen up. Long-term down the road, they can wear out and they can loosen up and they might need to replace. You may be five years down the road, and because of those components getting loosened, it may dislocate, and they're going to have to go back in. Or worse, again, the site gets totally surgically infected. Let's say I am a total hip replacement, and you're treating me, and you come in and you say, so, Mr. McKeever, where's your pain at? And I'm like, well, it's back on my incision site back here, and I point to it, and I'm like, it's about an 8 out of 10. What should you do to that incision site? You should, yeah, movement, yeah. Inspect it. Inspect it, yes, right? Like Dr. Oreskin said, we don't work on clothing. If they've got a surgical site, look at it, right? What could you, yeah, palpate, check for infection. Good, Bianca, right? We can clearly see if it's infected, right? It gets red and angry and pussy. Mm, it's not moist enough. We want to get in there and look at that site right? What if it has a dressing? You could still peel back the dressing and look at it and not damage the dressing, right? What if you go to do therapy with them and that dressing is loaded down with blood because they haven't had a dressing change? We might need to get that dressing changed before we do therapy because the last thing we want is somebody walking down the hallway, you know, singing do what diddy diddy dum diddy do with blood running down the back of their leg, right? And they will bleed a little bit. That happens. Right? They, they, they got their leg cut open. Of course, they're going to bleed a little bit. So we treat bodies. We treat skin. We treat muscle. We treat bone. You have to look at the surgical site. That goes for total knees. That goes for total shoulders. That goes for anything. Goes for low back pain. Right? What if, you know, I'm here coming in for low back pain and you, know, you look at my back and all of a sudden my back is all blistered and bruised. That might be why I'm having low back pain, right? But if you didn't look at it, you wouldn't have known that. So you've got to look at the patient. I know you don't, may not want to look at their bottom, but sometimes you just have to. Bone tissue and soft tissue healing will occur. Recovery takes about four months. During the maximum protection phase, we're going to do stuff like bilateral ankle pumps, isometric glute sets, quad sets some active knee flexion while avoiding hip flexion, so some supine knee flexion, and then follow just those hip precautions that they have for whatever type they have. We're gonna be doing transfer training, getting them out of bed, working, getting in and up and down and moving all around bed. Get them a raised toilet seat so they don't have to sit so low on a toilet. Um, you know, there's, you know, I don't know if you've ever gone to like one of the airports and you go to sit down on the toilet and you realize that toilet is sitting on the floor. That's not good for a total hip replacement, right? Raised toilet seats helps them. They may need some rigid wheel seats, chair seat pads. 
understand what their weight bearing status is. By three weeks, even if they've got precautions, they should be starting to progress to full weight bearing or weight bearing is tolerated. The moderate or that subacute phase begins when a patient can demonstrate quad control, active knee flexion, reduced pain and compliance with precautions, meaning once they're starting to get more active and mobile, start adding more challenging exercises. We can start adding some light resistance, maybe some yellow and red therabands. Standing activities to stress that active hip motion. So getting some rocking back and forth, balance activities. We still have to enforce those hip precautions. And then once we get to the minimal perfection or the return to kind of function phase and the chronic phase style, the physician may discontinue total hip precautions, but they may not. That we have to understand what our physicians want from us. Right? Do only PTs do home visits? PTAs can do home visits for sure. We'll talk, or PTAs can do home visits. We'll talk about that for sure in um, this semester when we start getting you guys prepped to go out to the real world. Um, it's, it's the only time you really can't do, like for student PTAs, it's really hard for you guys to do clinical rotations in the home health setting because honestly, if I'm doing home health, my schedule is so wonky. You know, you're not going to want to, be up at four o'clock in the morning, go see a patient with me and then not have another patient till noon. And then maybe have five patients at noon and then have no one till five and then have three patients at five o'clock. It just doesn't work out well. But in the real world, yeah, PTAs can treat home health. The main goal out of all of this is to get the patient back to normalized gait, preferably without an assistive device or with LRAD, least restrictive assistive device. If they are a sports activity person, get them back to sports activities. In that minimum protection phase, we want to reduce our pain, continue physical function, and then just work on getting that rehab so they're back to normal. A hemiarthroplasty is when only one half of the surgical uh, site needs replaced, whether it's the acetabulum or the femoral head. It'll mainly to eliminate pain is why they do it. So if you've got like a S tabulum that's kind of damaged, they're going to replace it. Same ideas go along for total hip replacement. If they do a posterior approach, a lot of times they're going to have posterior hip precautions. Hip fractures. Fewer than 2% of all hip fractures occur in people younger than 50. That means 98% of all hip fractures occur in patients older than 50. That kind of makes sense. Right? They're the more likely to fall. If they're over 65 years of age, mortality rates are about 50% within the first year. Think about that for a second. So, you know, I'm going to pick on Bianca here because I haven't picked on her in a while. Bianca is, you know, she's in her late 70s. She's feeling good. She falls down. She breaks her hip. Right? It is. Right? Breaking your hip can be a death sentence. You're 100% right especially if you don't immediately get treatment, right? So maybe they've, and we've all heard horror stories of patients that fell in their bathtub and laid in their bathtub for three or four days before somebody realized that they hadn't seen them or they haven't come seen them, right? Or mom hasn't called. It's kind of sad, right? That's why we need, uh, I've fallen and I can't get up. No, just joking. Ironically enough, like my, my watch that I have, my Apple watch actually has a fall sensor in it. I tested it. I did a break fall and it lets me know it'll pop, it popped up. I've indicated that I've noticed you've had a fall. Do you, would you like me to call 911 for you? That's pretty neat. Yeah. So Dr. Resta said her friend's mom fell and lay there for four days before anyone checked on her. Imagine how sad that was and how much probably in pain she was. Um, I know we had one where it was, uh, there was a lady when I was working at Summerlin who she lived out towards the um, Lake Las Vegas area. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Ruskin. But she was out towards Lake Las Vegas and her nearest neighbor was about three miles away. It took her a day to crawl to her nearest neighbor. And she literally just crawled out of her house and crawled to her nearest neighbor because some, I don't know why she couldn't call. I don't know. There's some other stuff that went along with that. But at 65% or 65 or older, 50% of them die within the year. 
and it may increase up to 4% per year after that. So it's 66 and it may be 54%. Think about that. We have some upcoming pictures on the types of fractures. There are about 300,000 hip fractures annually, cost about $10 billion per year, and is the most common among elderly and more women than men. And that kind of makes sense. Yeah, check in on our elders, exactly, Joe. But it makes sense that it's gonna be more women than elders. Why? What do women suffer from more than men? Osteoporosis. Yeah, osteoporosis, weak bones. It's classified by the location and severity, whether it's simple or comminated, meaning really complex. Is it extracapsular, being outside of the joint capsule? Is it in the trochanter, trochanteric? Is it along the femoral neck? Is it subcapital, meaning at the bottom of the femoral head? Is it a proximal femoral shaft or subtrochanteric region? So all of those, if you see in the notes that it says that the fracture is a trochanteric fracture, you can pretty much, by knowing your anatomy, know that fracture is going through the trochanters, right? You know how painful that's going to be. Well, what can be some complications? Malunion. What does a malunion mean? What does the abbreviation mal mean? Bad, yeah. So a bad union, right? This is like a bad relationship. Things just don't mesh and they don't come together very well. So maybe you get a, maybe you have, and you get a malunion on any fraction or a fraction fracture. So maybe instead of it coming back together like this, the bones are sitting like this. And maybe it's not detected for whatever reason and they fuse back like that. That's bad, right? Delayed union would be an idea where, again, they don't come see us for a while. Non-union avascular necrosis. So this is where they have a fracture. It cuts off the blood flow. And what starts setting in? Necrosis, which means what? Death. Death. Yeah. It's dying. Yeah, exactly. Everything in that area is dying. The treatment options are going to depend upon the patient's age, location, severity, fracture, quality of bone, everything along that line. This is from a um, surgical textbook. Mortality after one year, about 50%. After three years, 60. At six years, 77, so on. 20 to 30% of the patients regain prior, prior level injury of independence. So a pre-injury level of independence. So it's not bad, but only two and three, or two or three out of 10 actually get back to normal. 15 to 40% require institutionalized care for more than a year meaning they're in a sniff for more than a year. And then about 50 to 85% or so, greater than 50% will use in a device to ambulate. We have all these different things here for the protection phases. I'm not gonna read through them. You guys can read through them. These are straight out of your book, but just understand that in the early phases, our main goal is pain control and protection of that surgical site and protection of the patient, reducing swelling moderate or that subacute phase, increasing weight bearing, improving balance, protection, safety, energy conservation, and then late or that kind of return to function phase, getting back to normal gait dependence and reduced use of assistive devices. So here's kind of looking at a picture. Here's looking at you, kid. Looking at a picture, kind of looking at the different types of fractures. Most docs I've talked to that I've seen in surgical say they prefer them where it's kind of in a, a pretty large bony area because they're easier to do repairs on. When you get something like this, just this femoral head fracture, well, then that breaks apart and gets in here into this acetabulum, chews up this acetabulum, they end up needing a replacement anyway. So obviously clean fractures are better than split fractures where they kind of splinter and fall apart. Here's looking at it from the blood supply issue and things tearing, another picture of fractures. Hips, what can happen at the hip? Well, you can have all kinds of hip fractures as well, meaning where they get an open reduction, internal fixation. Any surgery where they cut you open, right? So where they cut you open is an open reduction. So they are opening up the leg. Internal fixation means they're going to go in and put 
these screws and rods in to fixate or fix the bone internally. So if this is open reduction internal fixation, what is this down here? Closed reduction external? Yeah, it's external. yeah, so this is open reduction external fixator, right? So these are external fixators. These are just handles you can use to drag the patient around therapy. No, don't do that. Don't. That's not what those are used for, right? Those are external fixators that are keeping the bones nice and tight while they heal. Could you imagine having all that on your hips? That'd be uncomfortable. That wouldn't be very much fun to me. Um, bathroom would be really hard. You're exactly right. It is extremely difficult, Joe, when you have those external fixators. But if you have that external fixator, again, that's not something you grab a hold of. The other problem is if I do this external fixator, I'm going to have a constantly open wound on my skin where that pin goes into me. They'll eventually come off. Don't worry. The external fixators don't stay on forever, but that opens an area for infection. Hip dislocations are treated conservatively with bed rest, traction, and protected limb uh, weight bearing for up to 12 weeks. This is more looking at those open reduction internal fixations. There's a couple different styles we have. The one thing I want you guys to think about is any time that this happens, where they put a metal tube or a metal rod down the center shaft of the femur, you're going to hear it labeled as an IM rod, an intramedullary, so in the middle of the bone rod, intramedullary. They can have screws, they can have staples, there's all kinds of things that go along with it. The main goal, again, when we have these is protection of the surgery site and safety and energy conservation. What else can we get? We can get tendinopathies and muscle strains, repetitive trauma, femoral acetabular impingement, where the labrum, or like I said with my one patient, the labia of the hip gets impinged, right? The labrum of the hip gets pinched in that kind of femoral head uh, acetabular groove can lead to pain, gait deviations, imbalance in muscle flexibility, neuromuscular control, and decreased endurance, right? Anytime we injure our legs, it weakens our ability to get around. Round, round, I get around. No, just kidding. Proximal femoral oste osteotomy. An osteotomy means we're going to cut stuff apart, right? Take out a chunk of bone. Why we, we do this, if a patient has degenerative joint disease, but they're not quite ready for total hip replacement. So improve the function due to osteoarthritis. They're going to go in, kind of chunk it, shift the weight so the weight-bearing point of that actual femoral neck changes, and use a fresh area to weight bear on. Again, it's a temporary fix they're eventually going to need. I'll talk about that in a second, Bianca. Good question. Um, they're eventually going to need a hip replacement, but this can stave off the hip replacement for a couple of years for them. So Bianca asked, how is a pinched labrum fixed? There are two different schools of thought for that. The one school of thought is physical therapy and learn to live with it. Because honestly, from the ones I've seen that have gone in from labral repairs and labral repairs, they go in, they take um, basically a hot knife or a laser they trim off the part that's pinched, and then they pull that out. But the problem is, if I pull out a chunk of your labrum, does that decrease the overall structural integrity? Yeah, Joe, did Joe so Joe, you had a labral repair? Is that what you had? Yeah, labral repair, and they shaved down the femoral head. Yep. Because FAI. And you're probably right back where you started, right? Nothing changed? Yeah, I'm... Basically, the only thing that helps me is just physical therapy. I'm going to try a cortisone injection, but I don't know if it'll help. Yeah, and, I, and I, so you're an excellent example of it. And from what I've encountered with most patients is, honestly, I find they get about the same results out of getting physical therapy. You know, probably after your surgery, you felt good for a little while, but then it just kind of goes right back. It's almost like... I was, I was better for like six months, and then I like retore it. I just felt it re again. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Once you've injured an area, right, it's more likely to get injured again. 
So again, the main idea there, Bianca, is two different thought processes, conservative and learning to live with it, or going in and doing surgery and then, you know, kind of having this repetitive cycle where they have to keep going in to trim off labrum. And eventually it decreases the structural integrity of the joint. Osteoarthritis is a focal loss of articular cartilage with variable subchondral bone reaction. 7% to 25% of adults over 55 in the white European population have osteoarthritis of the hip. Joint pain is usually the most common functional impairment you see with this. So how do we help patients with osteoarthritis? Well, we can minimize their disability, reduce progression by patient education, diet, weight control, and footwear, right? Honestly, I can't tell you how many people wear cheapy, cheapy shoes, right? I'm sure probably all of you know somebody, either in your family or your friends, that are the type of people that buy like the $5 shoes at Walmart for running or something like that. And you're like, man, how do you wear those? Those make my feet hurt just looking at them. Good shoe or good footwear is really important. Diet is also important, along with controlling your weight. Conservation interventions, working on balance, gait training, manual therapies. We're not going to reverse fully osteoarthritis, but we can at least keep it from progressing further, right? We can do that secondary prevention. Leg cap, I can never say this one, cave Perth's disease, I just call it LCP is where the hip condition, and it's usually between four and eight years old, the hip is actually not a normal shaped hip. So the femoral head gets kind of this weird, um, almost phallic shape to it. It can heal naturally, right? It can just be that the hip hasn't fully developed for the kid. But if, again, looking at that hip there, where'd my mouse cursor go? I lost my mouse cursor, oh no. I have totally lost my mouse cursor. There we go. So if that hip is poorly laid out, right, and it's not a normal shape, is that going to potentially cause that hip to dislocate as a kid? Right, so now here's my acetabulum. My acetabulum is normal shape, but my femoral head's kind of weird shaped. Is that gonna cause possibly a chance for dislocation as a kid? Yeah. Right? And a lot of these kids that I've treated, the hips will literally, they'll walk, and as they're walking, the legs just kind of drop out. Plunk, 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 right? Some kids will heal naturally. Some, they may have to have some surgery to repair it, which is sad. But, you know, any early hip surgery can lead to long-term complications from it. Pubalgia is exactly like it sounds. Anytime you see alga, it means they've got pain. So this is pubic region pain. Typically, results from athletic activities, especially stuff like gymnastics or dance, they can get pubalgia where the pubis synthesis just feels off. They'll often have lower abdominal pain with exertion and minimal to no pain at rest. So as long as the pubis is at a neutral state, it doesn't hurt. But during activity, it hurts. Primarily, we're just going to treat it conservatively. Rest, ice, can't really compress it. You cannot, yeah, actually, great question, Amanda. Can it happen with pregnancy? Yup. Right? Because again, I'm going to say this baby is parasite. Right? Baby can cause all kinds of bad things to happen to mom's body. So, yeah, it can happen with pregnancy as well. Right? So, we're just going to treat it as we see it. If they have some hip pain with us, treat it conservatively. Right? If they have pregnancy, we got to watch. We can't do all our modalities with it, but we can do stuff like ice packs or hot packs, depending upon where they are with their pubalgia kind of concern. Um, and also just staying off of it and stop doing, you know, triple backflips for a week or two, right? Letting that area and that irritation calm down. Bursitis is nothing more than inflammation itis of the bursa. And I'm sure all of us at some point have had bursitis and may not have known they've got it. I've got a little bit of it today just sitting here. Um, the bursa gets inflamed from excessive compression or repeated friction. So how do we treat that? Well, we can rest it. We can use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So NSAIDs like um, Advil, uh, hydrocortisone, stuff like that. Eliminate the activities that make it worse. So if you notice that you have bursitis, stop doing the activities that make it flare up. 
and we're going to work on focusing on flexing, flexibility and strengthening and stretching with the patient that has bursitis. Ischial bursitis or ischial tuberosity bursitis, or as known as weaver's bottom. Well, why is this called weaver's bottom? Because when people sat in the weaver position, I don't know if I can even sit, I can't sit in weaver position or tailor position. When they're sitting there for a long period of time, even sitting in crisscross applesauce, like I like to sit, I put a ton of, or fix your technique. Yeah, there we go, Dr. Resting. Great, actually, comment. I didn't think of that, but you're 100% right. Right? If you're doing exercises at the gym and it's causing bursitis, it's probably technique based. And you need to, you know, it's, that's one of those where every time I'm doing deadlifts, I'm feeling pain at this burst side. And so let's see how you're doing a deadlift. And they're doing, I won't say CrossFit deadlifts because that would be picking on CrossFit a little too much. But, um, you know, they're doing CrossFit deadlifts and they're not having good form, and they come to see us, and we show them how to do a proper form, and all of a sudden, they're like, a week later, they're like, hey, I can do deadlifts now, and I don't get bursitis. It's magic how good form helps, right? Um, issue of bursitis, like I said, we all, I think I would be willing to bet we could probably do a study on issue of bursitis and COVID, and I'd be willing to bet issue of bursitis went up. What would you think, Dr. Oreskin? Do you think we went up on issue of bursitis? because of sitting so much for COVID. I know I get my butt uh, tired. Yeah, I'm, I'm an example. Yep. Of it. Yep, I had to, I couldn't, I had a metal folding chair for the first two months. And after that, I couldn't sit at all. Yeah. So I had to get, had to get I, a real computer chair at home. Yeah, I had a kind of cheapy computer chair at home. And those first couple months of teaching from home, I was like, oh my God, every time I got up, my butt just hurt. And I went out and spent my money on my razor chair and now it doesn't, Occur as much, but it also encourages me to get out of the chair a little bit more, right? So how do you fix it? Get up, get moving, right? We know this. If you're sitting in a chair for a long period of time, so why I try to remember to give you a break every hour, but Mr. McKeever's old, and when I grew up to school, you know, back when, back when, back when we went to school, they didn't give us none of these fancy breaks, um, but I can see the, the process of doing it because it can help prevent it, right? can mimic hamstring strain. I had that where I thought I strained my hamstring. In reality, I just had issue of bursitis. My butt was sore. It typically affects thinner people. Well, that, that completely rules me out. Wow. But, you know, I don't have a lot of padding back there, so we'll just go with that. And cyclists. It can definitely, that's where I've seen it in the clinic, is people that love to do especially road cycling or uh, mountain biking, where they're constantly bouncing down hills. And I, I made you guys laugh. I appreciate it. Right, they're constantly bouncing down hills and they went out and bought like the Walmart off the rack mountain bike. Yeah, that's possible too. Good point here. We're not working out as much. So our glutes might atrophy. I'm just going to say it just from sitting too much. And I bet we could do a whole study on that and it'd be interesting. But again, Mr. McKeith. Yes. Um, for like someone who sits at, uh, for like a desk job, we have, okay, this is probably going to be stupid. I know nope, that we have, a bursa, we have a bursa in our elbow, right? Anywhere where there's a joint? Pretty much there's bursas in most of the way through our body, yep. Okay, so someone, say, who has, like, a desk job is on their computer a lot, they would kind of get that because it's in the same position all the time and on the desk? Sure, I mean, you could get, technically, if you have a desk job, you could get bursitis in multiple places. Yes. Right? You can get it behind the knees, you can get it in the buttocks, you could get it, depending on if you don't have the right um, ergonomics, which we'll talk about, you can mm -hmm. get it in the elbows, you can get it in the wrists. So for sure, like, yeah, it's one, of the, one of the downsides of desk jobs is, number one, it decreases life expectancy because you're sitting so much, right? Yeah. And number two, as you're sitting so much, your body just kind of is like, okay, I'm going to break down now. And you end mm -hmm. up with bursitis and inflammation and tight muscles and neck strain, right? All of us video gamers and PT, PTAs have to advise patients to get wrist rest. Absolutely, right? Okay. I'm missing that right now from my mouse because I knew, usually have a nice kind of um, wrist rest that I rest my wrist on and I'm just sitting on the, this little makeshift desk I have and man, I can feel my carpal tunnel flaring when I use it. So for sure, absolutely, bursitis can occur. That's why we recommend, that's why, I mean, ideally, get up as much as you can, but at least get up and move and stretch and do stuff every hour if you can, right? 
And we can teach them, like Dr. Ruskin said, we're going to teach them all kinds of ways to reduce the overall stress in our body if you have a desk job. Because unfortunately, desk jobs are here to stay. It's not like they're going away. We're not going to have another industrial revolution anytime soon. Um, and we just have to learn to live with them and maximize our life with those type of jobs. I will be happy, and I'm sure Dr. Ruskin will be happy when we can pace around the room and don't have to sit at a Zoom call anymore. And you guys should be a little bit happy for that too. So as I was saying, we're going to talk about psoas bursitis. <laughs> well, that can happen. Think about where your psoas is, right? Hip flexion bursitis. You can get iliopectineal bursitis. Again, back in the pectineal line region, local tenderize over the iliopsoas muscle and tendon, diffuse radiating down the anterior leg, most noted in hip flexion. But again, with any bursitis, what are we going to do? Reduce the pain, irritation, rest, ice, NSAIDs, and stretching. They may need cortico injections or cortico steroid injections. That's going to be on the doc. Even a PT is not going to recommend that saying, hey, you know, I think you might, do, you might want to do some cortico steroid injections. That's a little bit beyond our scope of practice. But a PT may talk to an orthopedist and say, you know, what do you think about doing this with the patient? Right? PT is not going to directly recommend it to the patient. We should not either. We should not say, hey, you know, I think you'd be good for getting um, ischial tuberosity injections. Muscle contusions or bruises. The big one you hear about, especially in sports, are called hip pointers. Have any of you heard that injury before? There's just one of those a few weeks ago. Um, I think it was, I forget which hockey game I was watching, the one player got a hip pointer because he took an elbow right to the iliac crest. Right? Hip pointers are where we get contusion and bruising and the hip process. The only thing we can do for it is really rest, ice, maybe some compression wraps if we can do some wrapping on it. Take weight off of it if it's really bad. Right? Think about like your wide receiver that in football that goes out for a catch, lays out, and as he's catching it, has a defender come tackling him down, and their iliac crest gets jammed down into the artificial turf. That's going to cause a hit pointer injury. They're going to get sore. Or somebody that tackles them and lays the crown of their helmet right into their iliac crest. Pain. We'll stretch and strengthen, right? And progress pain and obviously injury progression. Acetabular fractures can be potentially life-threatening in nature. So if you get fractured acetabulum, it can be problems because it leads to further pelvic fractures. They can be either stable or unstable. I know I've thrown around this term of unstable fracture, but what does it literally mean if I say unstable fracture? What do you think? If, if you think something's unstable, what would you think it mean? Non-weight bearing. Okay, non-weight bearing. Probably going to be on non-weight bearing. Good. But what is the, what is the fracture itself going to look like? Is it like almost, I mean, a complete break? It's like yeah. about. And it's just splintered and there are chunks here and there, right? It's just, it's not a fixed fracture yet. So when we have those, it can be really problematic. They may have to do an open reduction internal fixation. If the actual acetabulum has a bulge or pulled off of the, the actual hip, we're going to treat with conservative rest, hip extended and externally rotated. So they're going to be put in a very specific position to allow the bones to heal. After the bone is healed, progressive flexibility will continue. If they're unstable, they can be rotationally unstable, meaning that a patient can't do any type of rotation motion with it, or it can possibly send a bone places you don't want it. They usually do need an open reduction internal fixation with extended bed rest, and we will see them based on the severity of the fracture. Oftentimes, we won't see them necessarily for that hip, We'll see them for general conditioning while they are on bed rest. So maybe doing some exercise with their upper extremities or if they're non-affected hip, just to keep them kind of functional until we can get them up and moving again. So this is kind of looking at the different complications after a pelvic fracture. Um, the, the model we use to classify them calls a latern laternal fracture. You don't have to know those specifically. They exist out there. Um, but just in case you see it, if you're in the clinic and it says the patient has, you know, laternal level one, it tells you it's an acetabular fracture. When we look at it, those who cannot have surgery, they'll be protected weight-bearing for about nine weeks. 
if they have surgery, partial weight bearing will encourage for eight to 10 weeks and then progress from there. So this is looking at what can happen with those acetabular fractures. You got a couple of beautiful pictures here. When you're looking at these, this far one on the right or the left here, right? This one way over here, that is a clear unstable fracture, right? You got a bone piece that is no longer where it should have been. That's when we talk about an unstable fracture. Even this, these two over here, right, are pretty unstable. This one, the middle one B, not too bad. It, that can be stable pretty quick. When we get those bones kind of moving around, problem. So there's some more kind of pictures. And again, you can see how if you have a fracture like this, it could be quickly life-threatening. Because again, we know that we have that femoral nerve pretty close to this. And if that femoral nerve, one of these pieces of the bones goes and cuts through that femoral nerve, they're going to bleed out internally. Uh, muscle strains, we all have had these at some point, either hamstrings, or the psoas, adductors, rectus femoris. Injury management, initial will cold pack it for 20 minutes, three to five times a day. Avoid motions that cause pain. Crutches may be used. Patients shouldn't automatically go to crutches, but they may be used. Sleeping with pillows between both knees can help. And then strength training proceed with healing times differ among patients. I can tear my hamstring and Joe can tear his hamstring or strain his hamstring. And he may heal in a two days. It may take me weeks to heal with the same strain. That's why strains are so challenging. Adductor muscle strain or groin pull happens a lot of times with sports like basketball, or soccer or football, where you just kind of get your legs spread farther than they, you're comfortable with, right? Uh, you can do compress uh, compression, ice, all your normal stuff. I've seen a lot of ultrasound on this as well. So your pulsed ultrasound, where we're working on healing. Seated butterfly stretch are great with this, as long as it's without pain. It's where you bring your legs in and kind of pushing those knees to the floor. Iliopsoas or a hip flexor pull occurs when sudden forceful extreme hip extension caused forced hip flexion against resistance. Um, protection, rice, compression, all that, like we've done with all the other kind of strains. Hurdler stretch after the patient demonstrates improved hip extension, right? We'll talk about that when we practice different stretches. Stretches should be slow and static, meaning no ballistic stretching with iliopsoas strains. And then we need to correct muscle imbalances. What caused it in the first place? Uh, so that, that's pretty much what we've gone through already. So we're going to actually work on this when we get back to lab. We're going to work on stretching to increase hip extension, flexion, abduction, adduction, rotation. There are all kinds of stretches out there. There's rectus femoris stretches, hamstring stretches, TFL. That's going to be a whole lab in itself of working with stretches as well as working with passive range of motion activity. Open chain activities versus closed chain activities, right? Remember, with open chain, the distal segment is mobile. Closed chain, the distal segment is fixed. When we're working on those activities, we can do isometric or we can do dynamic, meaning movement type activities. We're going to go through a couple of those in class on lab. With mobilization of the hip. We are going to typically, when you do hip mobilization, and then we're talking about mobilization, I'm talking joint mobilization. So we have a capsular pattern up here. We're going to do it in conjunction with thermal agents. So we want to warm the area up before we mobilize. Position the patient for comfort and compliance with relaxation, because if they're not relaxed, we can't mobilize the hip. Warming the tissues helps. Both the patient and the PTA should be in correct body posture. Dr. Reskin and I will definitely preach to this from now until eternity. Protect your own body, because if you don't, you'll be in the bed beside the patient soon enough. We're going to actually talk through the different hip mobilizations. But again, if it comes to your boards, your board says, do PTAs perform mobilizations of joints? Our answer is no. No, very good. But we have to learn them how. What's the term for we learn? Didactically. We have to, you guys have to know when a PT is ordering joint mobilizations, why they're ordering, understand the process. And again, mobilizations go with 
capsular patterns. Distraction of the hip, so pulling the hip out and actually doing like traction on the hip. That again is a joint mobilization. I know the book talks about it. There are positions for PTAs to do it. I am of the personal belief that most manual traction I avoid as a PTA just because I think that is a skill that is specific to the PT because it requires a lot of assessment when it's happening. Um, we'll talk about it. I'll kind of show the technique for it, but that's about as far as we're going to go because it's really easy when you're doing distraction to over distract the joint, especially the hip or the spine. And you can really cause problems with the patient. But when we are mobilizing, and so I'm going to take it back to picture before we take a break here. When we are mobilizing, it doesn't matter if it's the hip, the elbow, the wrist, the joint, the neck, the back, I don't know, the toe. What position does that joint have to be in? Neutral position. Neutral position, otherwise known as also open. open, good. Open packed position, good. All right, so I'm going to pause recording. <laughs> 